All right, how's it going? Welcome to the first, I guess, actual video in the, the series on linear algebra. It's been a little while now since I've been prepping this video series and I'm excited to finally roll everything out and finally start making videos for it. So I'm very excited to, to get started with this. Now, the, the first sort of section that we're gonna be covering in this video series is on the topic of complex numbers. And when I first took linear algebra, complex numbers was also covered as a topic. And the motivation for covering it was similar to what I was describing in the course overview video. And when I was taking the class, I was saying, okay, well, I, I know in the literal sense what a complex number is, so all of this is going to be review. And while that was true for about, I would say maybe 70 to 80% of the material, I still found that there was some stuff that I had not heard of or not thought of before revolving complex numbers that were introduced in the, the class. So because of that, I, that's, this is also a, a sort of uh, foreshadowing thing to, to you, which is to say that even if you feel like you know what a complex number is, and, and you, if, if you feel like you do, you probably do. <laughs> Uh, but there, there might be some additional things that get covered in this video or the upcoming video that maybe you haven't heard of before. And I, I will say too, this video is really going to be more of an introductory video on complex numbers, kind of just motivating the, the reason why we have them and just some, some basic properties of complex numbers. But, but definitely more in the next video, we're going to be covering a couple topics that show up uh, revolving around complex numbers and some of that stuff might be new. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you get, you get something out of it is what I'm trying to say. So what I want to first do is to write down just a simple equation on the board to, to really get started here. And that equation is just going to be X squared minus one equals zero. And we might be interested in solving for X. And this is just algebra, right? And, and hopefully we, we are familiar with how we can solve this. We just essentially add one to the other side. And then when we do that, we get that X squared is equal to one. And then we say, okay, well, what number, if we, what number when we're looking for X, when we square it is equal to one. And we say, well, we know that one times one equals one. So we can have that X equals one. But we also know that negative one times negative one, or negative one squared is also equal to one. So we can have x equal to one or x equal to negative one, right? And in the case where we have equations like this, where we have x squared minus one equals zero, we are very familiar with, with learning how to solve these equations. But eventually mathematicians had, had solved enough of these equations and then they started to say, well, what happens if we modify this equation right here slightly? What happens if rather than this equation, we simply replace the minus sign with a plus sign? So maybe I'll write that down here. So x squared plus one equals zero. And then what happens if we try to go through the same process where we subtract one over to the other side, giving us x squared equals negative one? And when we get to this point, we can ask ourselves, or we could say, okay, well, what number when squared produces negative one? And we could try to think of all the, the numbers that maybe we are familiar with up until this point that could produce this. We could say, all right, well, any positive number squared is gonna be a positive, right? A positive times a positive is a positive. So whatever X is, it can't be positive. But we also know that a negative number times itself or a negative number squared also produces a positive number. So X can't be a positive number or a negative number. And then the only other real number that is left over is, is zero. And zero squared is zero, which is not negative one. So it's clear that if we were to only think of the real numbers as all the numbers that exist out there, then that would be telling us that there are simply some equations such as this one which would have no solution at all because we just went through the case of every possible real number and can easily show that there's not a real number that's going to satisfy this equation. And when you get to this point, it's kind of like, well, well what, what do we do? 
as, as people who are interested in math? Do we simply say that, we, do we simply give up on these types of equations? Do we simply say that they just don't have a solution and leave it at that? Or do we say, well, maybe there are just some numbers that we haven't considered yet. Some numbers that have properties other than the, the properties of the real numbers. And we could specifically see here, what if there are some numbers that one squared do in fact equal a negative number? And this was kind of some of the motivation for why these things called complex numbers got introduced. What I'm going to do right now is, is simply take the square root of both sides. I'm going to take the square root of the left-hand side, I, I just get x. I want to take the, the square root of the right-hand side, I get the square root of negative 1. And this number right here, the square root of negative 1, is known as the imaginary unit. And it is some, sometimes compactly written as the number i. Okay. And the, the number i is essentially one of the fundamental components for a, uh, for a complex number. But, but we just wanted to introduce this notation right here to describe um, what this quantity is, square root of negative 1. We're going to write it always as i. And I want to quickly say, too, that sometimes when people hear an imaginary number, they are thinking that an imaginary number is something that we just made up. And I, I guess in some sense you could say that's true, but, but really how we should be thinking of an imaginary number is a number that when squared produces a negative. And we just so happen to call it an imaginary number because an imaginary number is not a real number, but it is not made up in the sense that it is somehow fake or anything like that. It is a very real uh, definable quantity. And, and we're going to use that throughout the next uh, couple of videos. Okay. So hopefully this makes sense where we can see why we might want to introduce this thing, the number I, this imaginary number. But again, the section is on complex numbers and not just imaginary numbers. It turns out that complex numbers are a generalization of both real numbers and imaginary numbers. It kind of combines them together. So as a, so as a starting point for this video series is to write out the definition of what a complex number is, and then we're going to go through that together. Okay, so we have the definition for a complex number right here. So let's go through it together. So a complex number is gonna be denoted as a number z in c of the form z equals a plus i b, where a and b are real numbers and i is the imaginary unit. And in terms of notation, we're gonna write that a is the real component and b is the imaginary component. So just to quickly un unpack what this means, uh, first, we're going to typically denote a complex number with the letter Z, and that's not always gonna be the case. There's no special reason why we use Z, but that's just a common notation. So throughout this video and the next video, we will be referring to a complex number typically as Z. Um, and the set of all complex numbers is denoted by a block letter C. So kind of like the block letter R is the set of real numbers, block letter C is the set of complex numbers. Now for the actual structure of a complex number, in other words, what really is a complex number, every complex number is going to be of this form right here. So we see that the complex number is going to be a sum of two different terms, where the first term is just a real number A, and we would call this the real, the real component of the imaginary number. The real component of the imaginary number. But then there's also this second component to the imaginary number, and that's what we, that's what we refer to as the imaginary component of the complex number. 
So this would be the imaginary component. And if you have a real component plus an imaginary component, then the sum together in general produces a complex number Z. Okay. So hopefully this makes sense. It kind of is combining together real numbers and purely imaginary numbers uh, into a single generalization. And I think what I want to do before we start to look at some properties of complex numbers, because that's really what this video is going to be about. In case we haven't seen this before, uh, just to make sure we're being absolutely thorough, I just want to show this really quickly. And what I want to show is what happens first when we look at this imaginary unit i and we raise i to various powers. So here's what I mean. If we start with i, uh, this is going to be trivial, but i raised to the, the one power is just itself, it's i. Then if we were to take i squared, let me do this, i squared. If we think of i as a square root of negative one, or it's really defined as i squared being negative one, then this one should be clear as well. So i squared is negative one. But then what about i cubed? Because we can keep going, right, and taking larger powers of i. And i cubed is the same thing as i squared times i. But we just said that i squared was negative one. So this is really negative one times i, or just negative i, like that. And then finally, or not finally, well, I do mean finally, but uh, well, let's, let's keep going in the meantime, i to the fourth, let's uh, keep raising this to higher powers. Uh, i to the, fourth is, to the fourth is the same thing as i squared times i squared. And we know that i squared is negative one, so this is the same thing as negative one times negative one, or just the number one. You could say, okay, this is interesting. We're, we're, we're finding these different results for different powers of i. But what if we were to keep going? Let's maybe now look at i to the fifth. So we take i to the fifth. And i to the fifth is the same thing as i to the fourth times i. Now we just said that i to the fourth over here was equal to the number one. So this is just one times i, or just i. And here's where we get this interesting property that I want to point out, because we actually don't need to raise this to any larger powers, because we said here that i to the first was equal to i. And then now going up to basically increasing the power by four, going from one to five, we see that i to the fifth is also equal to i. So it seems that in raising it to four additional powers, we loop back to its the original, I guess, starting value of, of i. So the imaginary unit has this interesting property that it just cycles in powers of four, where it's gonna go from i to negative one, to negative i back to positive one. And then it's just gonna keep on cycling over and over and over, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And again, if, if raising i to any power is confusing, um, you, can, you can always break it down into uh, what is its remainder after, after dividing by four, and it's going to be one of these four possible values, okay? But anyways, I, I wanted to quickly show that just to make sure that we have, have seen that at some point, even though that might be a review for, for, for some of us. But anyways, with, with that in mind, no, getting a basic understanding of how multiplying i, raising i to various powers works, the first thing that we really want to do with complex numbers is we want to say, okay, now that we introduce these complex numbers, let's perform some basic arithmetic operations on these numbers. In other words, how can we work with them in, in the way that we've worked with, with real numbers? So what I'm gonna do is, is for the next couple of minutes, just, just go through the basics of that. Uh, and this might seem like review, again, if you've seen this before, but again, this is just to be very thorough. In, in going through this. So the first thing we might want to do is we might want to add 
two complex numbers together. So maybe I want to take z1 plus z2. And, and we would ask, how, how would we do that? We say, okay, well, z1 can be written in this form, and, and every complex number can. So it's going to be a1 plus i b1. And then let's add on z2, which maybe is going to have the form a2 plus i times b2. And typically what you want to do, and this is a common thing with, with complex numbers, is even though technically this is the answer right here, just simply writing it out according to the definition, we usually want to group together all the real components and then all the imaginary components. So that way the final expression, because z1 plus z2, this whole thing is a resulting complex number, so it should also have the form of being a real component plus an imaginary component. So that's, that's just going to be the, the last step here, where we're going to say, okay, let's collect all the real terms together, or in other words, the terms that don't contain a factor of i, and that's a1 and a2. So the real component would be a1 plus a2, and then next we're just going to take the imaginary component. So it's going to be i times b1 plus b2. And this is how we can write out the complex number z1 plus z2. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. And then maybe I should say addition and subtraction because subtraction is going to be very similar. Subtraction, I'll just put a minus sign on the bottom so we have plus minus. When we start to subtract complex numbers, the complex number by itself is always going to have this plus in the general definition. In the case where, let, maybe let me just provide a quick example. Let's say we have the number 2 minus i. This would be a complex number where, it, it could, in other words, it could be written of the form a plus ib in the case where a is equal to 2 and b is equal to negative 1. So even this number that has a minus sign right here, can still be written generally as a plus ib. And that's important because when we are subtracting complex numbers, they are still going to have the form a1 plus ib1 and a2 plus ib2. The only thing that's really going to change is this, uh, if this was a minus sign, this would also be a minus sign. And then just seeing how this, how this translates down here, this would then be a1 minus a2, and this would be IB1 minus IB2. Okay. So that is how we can add and subtract complex numbers. Now, let's keep going. There are two more fundamental operations that we are very familiar with, right? What if we wanted to multiply or apply multiplication to two complex numbers? Maybe we want to take the product Z1 times Z2. What would that look like? Well, we, we go through the same thing, right? Where we'd say Z1 is going to be A1 plus I B1, and Z2 is just going to be A2 plus I B2. And then we just expand this out. So we first take A1 times A2, then we take plus I times A1 times B2, and then plus i times b1 times a2. And then the final term is gonna be, we have two factors of i, so i squared times b1 times b2, like this. And then same thing, we just want to group the real terms together and the imaginary terms together. So for the real terms, this term right here has no factor of i. So that's definitely gonna be a real term. And then also, this term over here is actually going to be a real term. We might say, why is that the case? It seems like there's a factor of i in there. But i squared, if we remember, is equal to negative 1. So this is really negative 1 times b1 times b2, or just minus b1 times b2. So the real component of this product is going to be a1, a2 minus b1, b2. Now, for a complex number, it also has an imaginary component, so plus i. And then we would just look at the remaining terms that have factors of i in them. So 
This first term would be A1, B2. Second term would be B1, A2. Like that. Okay. So this is how we can multiply two general complex numbers. Okay. So hopefully this makes sense. Uh, one more thing that we're going to, to do is, well, you can probably imagine we're going to divide two complex numbers. So let's divide, or division, division, I should write Let's apply division to complex numbers. So if we want to divide two complex numbers, take Z1 divided by Z2. Another way of writing this is Z1 times Z2 inverse, okay? So what I'm going to do is, uh, hopefully it makes sense that we already know how to multiply two complex numbers. That's what we did just right here. The only thing that's really new in division is applying sort of the inverse of a complex number. So that's really what I'm going to show down here is how can we apply the inverse of a complex number? And then once you know how to apply the inverse, then you just plug that into here and perform the standard multiplication that we showed right here. Okay, so, so let's say that we want to just take the inverse of some complex number z. Another way of writing this is, is going to be, or, or I guess z to the negative one power. Another way of writing this is one over z, or just one over a plus ib, like this. And again, this is technically the answer, but we always want to get a complex number to be of this form right here, where it is a real component plus an imaginary component. And right now we have a fraction, which inherently does not show up in this form for a complex number. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of this fraction and to be able to rewrite this fraction as something real plus something imaginary. So how do we do that, right? And there's a trick that we can apply and, and I don't even wanna call it a, a trick. That sounds kind of weird because it's such a common tool that gets used when working with complex numbers is we're gonna multiply by the same quantity but we're gonna introduce a minus sign. So rather than a plus IB, we're gonna write a minus IB. And we're gonna write a minus IB on the bottom and the top. So that way, it's essentially like saying we're gonna take this number and multiply it by the number one, right? Because anything divided by itself is one. And when we do that, let's figure out what the denominator is first. So this is gonna be a squared, if we, if we multiply this times this. It's going to be a squared minus a times iv plus a times iv. So the second and third factor in the expansion are going to cancel. And then finally, we're going to have plus iv times minus iv. Maybe let me just do that up here in case that is uh, unfamiliar for us. So for that final term, we're going to have plus iv times minus iv. And First thing we'll do is, is we'll just look at the sign. So plus times negative gives us a negative. We have two factors of i, so that gives us i squared. And then we have b and b, so that gives us b squared. So this product gives us negative i squared b squared. But if we remember, i squared is just negative one. So we have one negative from here, one negative from i squared. So the two negatives cancel. And what we're simply left with is just b squared. So another way of writing this denominator is simply a squared plus b squared, like this. And then we still have the same, the, the numerator, which is one times this or just this by itself, a minus iv. Now we're basically done. And, and we might say, how, how do we know that we're done? Because this still looks like a fraction and not in this form right here. But if we remember, a and B are real numbers, so they can be fractions. So all I have to do is I, I can rewrite this by saying that the real component of Z inverse is going to be A over A squared plus B squared. And the imaginary component is going to be, let's see, plus I times negative 
b over a squared plus b squared like this. Okay, so now we've taken this number z inverse and we've written as a real component plus i times another real number, or it's a matching component. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. This is how we can perform the basic four operations on complex numbers. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to erase the board and then we're going to keep going because it turns out that as you can probably imagine from what we've, what you have done in previous classes is once we learn how to do basic arithmetic with the real numbers, that allows us to do standard algebra, kind of the algebra from, from well, I guess for me it was algebra one and algebra two, or, but whatever those courses are called for, for you. But then after that, there are still some additional functions that we can work with that are not taught typically in introductory algebraic courses. So that's what we're going to cover next after I uh, erase the board. Okay, so I got a little bit ahead of myself when I was talking there at the end. But what I want to do to motivate what we're going to do next is to kind of I guess take a trip down memory lane and provide a little roadmap of, at least for me, what math education was up until about calculus, I should say. And it's going to tie in to what, what we're going to be talking about with complex numbers next. So if you remember way back when we first started to learn about math, one of the first things that we do is we learn how to add two numbers. And maybe we're going to uh, just take an example like one plus two. Right, which is three. And addition is usually the first thing that we, we learn how to do right after counting numbers, right? We learn how to add two numbers. And then once we get familiar with addition, we learn how to subtract two numbers. But another way of thinking of subtraction is just the addition of negative numbers. So really introducing the concept of negative numbers is useful because it allows us to think of subtraction in terms of addition. The point of me saying that is some of the first fundamental operation or the first fundamental operation that we, we typically work with is addition. And then after we learn how to add and subtract, usually the next thing that comes up is, is multiplication. And then maybe I'll just draw a little arrow like this and I'll write out multiplication, multiplication. I hope I spelled this right. Multiplication. I think that's, I think that's right. And, and maybe an example of multiplication is three times seven, which is 21, right? And this inherently might initially feel like a different operation from addition, but notice that I, well, I, I drew an arrow going from addition to multiplication because we can think of multiplication as being built off of addition. In other words, once we understand addition, we can in turn understand multiplication. Because when we say we are multiplying three times seven, what we are actually doing is we are adding three seven different times. We're adding three plus three plus three plus three all the way up through seven different times or vice versa. When we take seven times three, what we're really doing is we are adding seven three different times. So what I'm trying to say is that, that multiplication can be understood in terms of addition. In other words, th this builds off of this. And also the, the final operation the, that is in the four primary ones that we're used to learning is, is division, right? Where if we had, and I'll erase this right after, but if, if we had A divided by B, we can just think of dividing two numbers as a times one over b. So division can be thought of as the multi as the as mul in terms of multiplication, where we have some number right here times a fraction or a rational number. So division can be thought of in terms of multiplication, which can be thought of in terms of addition. And up until this point, usually this we would call this basic arithmetic, right? And this is what we're learning. Maybe up until we're, I don't know, I think I was like 
10 or 11 or something like that. And then after that, usually what comes after multiplication and, and division is we start to learn how to take powers of various numbers. So maybe I want to look at the number, um, I don't know, 3 cubed or something like that. And 3 cubed is just going to be 27, right? And we all want to say, okay, well, how can we understand taking powers of numbers? Maybe I'll write this real quick. Powers of numbers. And we can think of powers of numbers in terms of multiplication, right? Because when we are writing out the expression 3 times 3, what we are really doing is we are taking the number 3 and multiplying it three different times, right? Or, or maybe just, I, I know you probably know this, but just to make this absolutely clear, so the numbers aren't the same, we'll take 4 cubed, right? So then 4 cubed is uh, 64. So what we're doing when we take 4 cubed is we're taking the number 4 and multiplying it by itself three different times. So in other words, when we look at a number raised to a power, that can be understood in terms of multiplication, which can be understood in terms of addition. So it's like there is this natural progression that we go through in arithmetic, where we understand some of the, the basic operations and how everything kind of builds off of that. And now that we are up until this point, we're taking various powers of numbers. And if we all of a sudden decide to set this power, maybe not to be a positive integer, but maybe a fraction, like one half, maybe let's take nine to the one half, then we also get various roots. We get the square root in this case, square root of nine, which is three. So once we have all of this framework built up in our math education, we now know how addition can lead to, eventually, we, we can build off of it to, to talk about various powers of numbers. And then this is the point where we typically start talking about algebra, right? where we start to introduce the, the letters and the numbers and combine them together, right, is what some people like to say. And, and algebra is about just working abstractly or more generally with essentially all of these types of operations right here. And while algebra might be confusing to some people, and it, admittedly, it can be difficult at first, um, Hopefully it makes sense that everything has this natural sequence of building off each other. And, and, and that, that is nice, right? But at least for me, once I got past Algebra 2, uh, that's what they called it when, when I took it, it was Algebra 2. Then I took this course that was called Pre-Calculus, which it, for, for you it might be called Pre-Calculus or Trigonometry or something along those lines. And in that class, it is supposed to, I guess, be like a um, help. It's supposed to help me prepare myself for calculus. I guess that was the idea. And in that class, all of a sudden, we start learning about these types of functions. We start learning about functions like sine of x, cosine of x, uh, the exponential function e to the x, stuff like that. And when I was taking the class, it was it was kind of confusing to me that these functions get introduced because it seems like there's this natural progression up through algebra two. And now we start talking about these random functions where it seems like sine and cosine and tangent and all those things. It felt at the time, it felt like those get used when we talk about triangles, right? Cause of course this is opposite over hypotenuse. This is adjacent over hypotenuse. And then exponential functions are these things that go up <laughs> or they go down if you have a negative for x. But, but the idea was that they're starting to introduce these things that didn't seem to build off of this natural progression that was developed up until Algebra 2. I should probably stop calling it Algebra 2 if that's probably not a uni universal name, but you, you get what I'm saying. And, and this was always a question that, that I had in my head up until we, we took, or I, I took calculus. And it was specifically, for me, it was called Calculus 2. It was at the end of Calculus 2. Because it turns out that these functions are not specialized to, in this case, triangles or things that go up or down. 
But, but these actually build off of everything that we have here. It is just another step in the, the natural progression of, of things that we learn. It's just that when we take these classes like pre-calculus and trigonometry and stuff like that, they don't explain how these things build off of, I guess, powers of numbers because we don't have the, the, the tool work or we don't have uh, the, the tool of calculus to help us understand that. So what I'm trying to say is that it, and if, if you've taken calculus before and you've heard of these things called Taylor series, then this, you, you probably know what I'm getting at. But I'm saying this because calculus is not a, a prereq for this course. Uh, is that these functions can be built off of powers. And what we're going to do is we're going to be now uh, looking at these functions in terms of complex numbers. Because what we've done up until this point is we've shown addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And then you can imagine we would, it'd be straightforward to take powers because we know how to multiply. But now I want to look at, let's look at complex numbers involving these functions. But in order to do that, we need to first see how these functions build off of powers of numbers. Or, or I guess powers of, of a given variable, in this case it would be x. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to write out some definitions right here. For the, cal for the people that are familiar with calculus, I'm going to write out the Taylor series for each of these. For people that aren't familiar with calculus, I'm going to just write out how these functions can relate to taking powers of a given variable. And, and then we're going to go from there. Okay, so this is how really the exponential function, the sine function, and the cosine function are defined. And, and, and hopefully it makes sense that it might be a good idea to see why people would, and math teachers would hold off on, on making this final step or this final jump. And I'll say that powers can uh, help us establish functions like e to the x, sine of x, cosine of x, stuff like that. Because what we're doing is that these functions are actually just defined as infinite summations of various terms where each term is a number raised to some power. But, but hopefully we see the idea how they, how they build off each other. Okay. But what I want to do to sort of finish off the video, because you might be saying, why? Well, like, okay, this is, this is cool to see the connection, but, but how does this relate back to complex numbers? And what I'm going to do is to look at this uh, top case right here for the exponential function. And rather than writing e to the z, I'm going to write e to the i times z, where i is the imaginary unit. So e to the i times z. So what would this be, e to the i times z? And we would say, okay, well, if, if e to the z is going to be 1 plus z plus z squared over 2 factorial plus z cubed over 3 factorial plus z to the 4th over 4 factorial plus it keeps on going. What we're going to do to get e to the i z is just to replace everywhere where we see a z with the quantity i times z. Okay? Because this is the definition of the exponential function. So we're going to start with the number 1 plus, now instead of z, we're going to write i z plus this is going to be i z so i z squared over two factorial plus i z cubed over three factorial plus and I'll just maybe write out one more one more term i z to the fourth over four factorial plus dot 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 right so this is how we can write out e to the i z. But what I want to do is I want to simplify this a little bit because we are hopefully familiar now with how we can evaluate different powers of, of I. And, and here's what I mean. So let's say, maybe let's bring this down here. 
So the, the first term is still gonna be the same, right? It's just the number one. The second term is, we can't do anything else to it, so it's just gonna be i times z. Now, this third term right here, this is really i squared z squared over two factorial, but i squared is negative one, so another way of writing this is just minus z squared over two factorial, okay? And then for this term right here, i cubed is just equal to negative i, so this is going to be negative i times z cubed over three factorial. So let's see, let's write this as minus i times z cubed over three factorial. And then for the, the last term, i to the fourth is just the number one. So that's, this is really the same thing as just z to the fourth divided by four factorial plus z to the fourth divided by four factorial, like this. And of course it keeps on going, right? And what I want to, to do now is I want to cleverly rewrite this infinite summation that, that is equal to e to the iz. And I just want to kind of do what we have been doing with those standard operations for complex numbers, but we're gonna collect the real terms together and then the imaginary terms together. So let's do that maybe down here. So if I look at all the real terms, I'm gonna have, just look at all the terms that don't have an i in it. So that would be this term, this term, this term, and it would keep on going, right? So we would have the number one, and then this would be minus z squared over two factorial. This would be plus z to the fourth over four factorial. And then you can hopefully see the pattern of the signs. So it would be plus, minus, plus, and then we'd have minus, and it would be z to the sixth over six factorial. Point is it would keep on going. This infinite amount of terms would all, this would contain all of the real terms in it. So this would be the real component, and then maybe I'll just put a plus, and now we just wanna write out the imaginary component, or in other words, i times whatever's left over, right? So we're gonna have i times, now let's just see what's left over. So here we're gonna have factor of i, and here we're gonna have a factor of i. So this is gonna be z. Here's going to be minus z cubed over three factorial. Then we're gonna have plus z to the fifth over five factorial minus and dot, dot, dot. Okay. So now we've taken this number, e to the iz, and we have split it into a uh, sum of real terms and a sum of imaginary terms. But I want us to take a minute to see what these things in parentheses really are. Because this first term in parentheses right here, one, wait, let's see, one minus z squared over two factorial plus z to the fourth over four factorial minus dot, dot, dot. That's what cosine of z is. So this term in parentheses right here, this is just a long way of writing out cosine of z. Okay. So, so let, let's, let's, let's go down here now. All of this is what e to the i z equals, of course, right? This first term in parentheses we said was equal to cosine of z. Now what about the imaginary term? i times this guy right here. Well, let's, let's see. We, we have z, probably see where this is going, right? Minus z cubed over three factorial, plus z to the fifth over five factorial, minus, and it keeps on going. So it turns out that this thing in parentheses right here is just another way of writing sine of z. Except with sine of z, there is no factor of i in front, whereas here we have the factor of i on the outside. So we just want to make sure that we put i in front of our factor of sine of z. So it turns out that e to the i times z is cosine of z plus i times sine of z. And this is a really, really interesting result.
This thing right here, and I want to put a box around this. This is about what we're going to finish the video off with. This thing right here is called Euler's formula. Euler's formula. And it's, it's one of the most interesting formulas that, that I think you could probably come across in math because it turns out that we are able to relate um, exponential functions to trigonometric cosine and sine functions. And how are they related? They are related by this equation right here. And what, what you might have seen before, because this equation shows up a lot too, is rather than just having a general number z, you could plug in really any number for z that you want. If we were to plug in pi, we would get e to the i, instead of z, we get pi. So maybe when we, hopefully we can see this down here, but we would get e to the i pi equals cosine of pi, and cosine of pi is negative one, plus i times sine of pi, which is zero. So that simplifies to negative one. If we were to rewrite this compactly, e to the i pi equals negative one, we could also just add one to the other side. And when we do that, we get e to the i pi plus one equals zero. This equation right here is known as Euler's identity, which comes from the general Euler's formula. Okay. So this is a really interesting result, but I want to, to finish the video off, <clears throat> excuse me, to finish the video off, I want to really motivate why I think this is such an interesting result. And, and, and just to do this, I don't want to say hand-wavingly, but, but with some basic sketches at least to, to make sense of this. So on the left-hand side, we have this, this exponential function right here. And hopefully we remember from whatever class we learned exponential functions in, that exponential function is going to look something like this. It's going to be a function that at the zero point equals one, and it, it keeps on going up. You can imagine exponential growth. As we get larger and larger, it just gets higher and higher up. Maybe let me just replace n equals zero. And, and it's a function that just keeps on doing this, basically. Whereas a function like sine or cosine, they're obviously going to be slightly different, but, but they have the basic property that if you were to plot them, it would look something like this. It would just go up and down, up and down, and it would oscillate repeatedly forever. So when we first, and this is what I want to get at, when we, when we first learn about these functions, the exponential function and trig functions like sine and cosine, they look incredibly different from each other. This thing just keeps getting larger and larger and larger, and it only goes up, or if this is a negative, it's only going to go down. Whereas a sine and cosine, it just it doesn't purely go up or purely go down. It just oscillates, and it oscillates forever in both the positive and negative direction. It seems, when we first learn about these, like these functions are completely unrelated from each other. And if you were to graph them like this, it would certainly seem that way. But what this equation is doing, Euler's formula, it's saying, let's hold off on that thought that these are disjoint and say that these are actually related to each other. But in order to relate these two seemingly different functions together, we need to utilize our friend, the complex unit or the imaginary unit. We need to utilize complex numbers. Okay. And, um, the, this is a connection that, that we're typically not going to make when we, when we, when we first learn about these things. Right. And just to, to, to finish off the, the video, what, 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 I, what I want to say to relate this back to complex numbers is that this is another motivation to understand how complex numbers can be useful in everyday problems and specifically how the imaginary unit can be useful in everyday problems is we see here that because the imaginary unit has the property of i to the one being i, i squared being negative one, i cubed being negative i, i to the fourth being one, 
that the fact that it, the imaginary unit has that cyclic property, and specifically, uh, it has a property where the signs on some of these are negative, or the signs on some of these are positive. The, the reason why the imaginary unit is useful is because it acts as the mechanism to alternate these signs in both the sine and the cosine terms. The reason why it can go up and then down and then up and then down and then up and then down the reason why you can do that forever in both directions is because we're just raising the imaginary unit to various powers. There's not a real number where we can, where we can do that, at least, at least in terms of, uh, of, of only even powers or only odd powers, right? So if we only worked with real numbers and we, we tried to pretend like these imaginary units were actually just made up and they, they really don't exist, then we would have a very difficult time to compactly write functions like sine and cosine and to relate them to the exponential function. But, it's, but what, I, what I'd like to get at is, is that hopefully we can see these things as not this mysterious thing, but as our friend, because the, it, it is a tool. It, it, it allows us to have this behavior and to have these incredibly um, interesting equations that connect things that we would have never thought would connect in the first place and hence why they're cool and why we should learn about them. Okay. I hope this makes sense. I, I wanted to try to convey why I think they're interesting and why I think they're useful. Hopefully that's what you got out of this. <laughs> All right. But um, yeah, thanks so much for watching. In the next video, we're gonna keep looking at complex numbers and I'm pretty sure that's gonna be the last video that we do for complex numbers. Again, it's still just to introduce these things before we really jump into to linear algebra. But, but, but hopefully we, we have a new appreciation for these guys if we didn't already. So uh, yeah, thanks so much and I will see you guys in the, the next video.